Good evening. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to yet another edition of Truth to Power. My name is Faraz Patel and I will be with you for the next one hour. Now, the purging of minority groups has not just started in this century. It has existed long before both you and I were born. Of course, one of the first signs was the purging of Bani Israel during the times of Fir'aun under the guise of Ramses II when the enslavement of Hebrew slaves had occurred during that time. Of course, Musa alayhi salam came, freed the Hebrews or the Bani Israel at the time, and of course, took them out of Egypt. We need to go thousands of years later. And of course, Jews were one of the other minority groups to be enslaved, this time by the Nazis at, towards, the, well, towards the beginning of World War II. 60 and 70 years later, it is now happening to Muslims. And across Europe, just like the purging of Jews had happened in the continent, Muslims are starting to bear the brunt, this time in the guise of far-right wing groups. And it, of course, comes at no other than Emmanuel Macron, the current Prime Minister of France, who, of course, just two months ago had said that Islam was in a crisis. Now, what he meant was that this is an opportunity for me, me as the president, and I quote, to get rid of Muslims and, of course, continue the purging of them. Well, joining me from the United Kingdom, I have Imran Shah. He is the CEO of the Muslim Public Affairs Committee in the United Kingdom. And he's one of the NGOs that have written to the United Nations asking for Emmanuel Macron to stop his purging of Muslims and, of course, for there to be some sort of understanding. Now, we as Muslims, of course, want to live a peaceful life wherever we are in the world, but with far-right extreme groups or far-right extreme politicians like Emmanuel Macron, it will make life that very difficult. Assalamu alaikum, brother Imran, and thank you so much for joining us here on Truth to Power. Walaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks for having me. No, it's an absolute pleasure to have you. Brother Imran, uh, give us an idea of the work that your NGO is doing, and of course, the necessity for it to be that more important at a time like, like this. So for us as an organization, we were set up around 2001, so just before uh, the US and UK went to war in Iraq, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, sorry, just before the 9-11 the incident. And back then, what our main focus was is that we wanted to empower Muslims to be able to organize and to essentially assert a, a, a political voice, um, knowing that for, for the near future, there will be a significant rise of Islamophobia, mm. a significant priority and focus on the Muslim as, as a problem from the state uh, and, uh, 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 and, and not just from essentially from far right extreme groups that may be active on the streets. So you know, we do a lot of work in terms of campaigning, we do a lot of work in terms of organizing and this is and we try and collaborate as much as possible in our effort. So this, this latest uh, uh, initiative that we've done, submitting that UN complaint, uh, uh, complaining to the UN mm. of the uh, treatment that uh, French Muslim citizens are receiving from particularly Macron is one of those examples. So we are just one of the 36 Muslim NGOs from 13 different countries. So America, New Zealand, uh, Austria, various different countries across Europe. We also have like uh, two organizations from South Africa, Association of Muslim Lawyers and uh, Muslim uh, Professional Association as well. As, and we have also organizations from Pakistan, from, uh, uh, from various different countries. And the, the complaint is basically, basically on two counts. One is uh, we're saying and asserting that France is of a violation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights international covenant civil and political rights and also um you know infringement of uh, the uh, united united nations convention of the rights of the child and there's so much evidence that i can go through mm. why is it that it's focusing on those particular things but for example you know if you just focus on the treatment of children that the emmanuel macron even before the samuel uh, Paty murder he wanted to introduce 
uh, IDs, number IDs mm. for children uh, uh, to basically crack down and to track where they are where necessary and to also ban homeschooling whatsoever. So there is, and in that same speech, there was so many uh, counts of him particularly saying Islam and Muslim. Yes. So when he's saying this is in the context of extremism, we know explicitly just from his, the number of times he's talking about Muslims and Islam, that what, what he really means is not the rest of the French population, especially not the, the, the white French population. He means essentially Muslims and his Muslims that have a problem. So, um, so that's just one example, but throughout the whole of, of 2020 and 2019, there has been a number of violent and illegitimate raids on Muslim homes and organizations. Uh, and that even happened, again, I'm trying to make a point here, it happened before the Samuel Patsy uh, murder. Uh, and the reason why I'm making that point is that the Samuel Patsy murder uh, was used as a means for exploiting the, and, and, the, uh, and to gain consent from the population for these uh, draconian discriminate laws. Already Macron before that was on a crusade against the French Muslim population to try and rein them in and, and co-opt them into the parameters that the French elite would be very comfortable for. Uh, and this is after decades and decades of French Muslims building their own civil society, their own independence, which should be legitimate in a French democracy. Mm. So you have you have so many uh, uh, about about seventy nine that happen uh, on Muslim organisations, masjids, uh, homes, uh, uh, and uh, various sort of uh, uh, institutions. Uh, in his second of October speech. He mentioned in his speech, 212 Muslim cafes were, were closed down, 15 masjids, four schools, 13 cultural associations owned by the Muslim community uh, in France. And when he talks about problematic practices, he says in quotes, he talked about women wearing hijab while they're in contact with the gen generic public. He talks about the need for the state to sanction and train imams. And he talks about the, the need for increasing dissolution of organizations and charities uh, and, and, uh, uh, and ending teaching of languages of origin. And that means that in schools, they only will be teaching French and no other language. So you have then subsequently after that, the, um, you know, one, uh, the one particular raid uh, uh, on Idris Shamidi, and, uh, and I'll, and I'll like, kind of bring myself to a close on this on this mm. part after this. I'm really trying to give you a full picture of what's happening. So Idris Shamidi is the head of Baraka City, and he is leading. Uh, he's he's part of a leading international charity organization, and he was, we know from his lawyer, raided by French elite troops. Pictures emerged that he was. A uh, victim of police brutality in front of his wife and children, and much much later, his organisation was dissolved later later this last year for absolutely no reason at all, apart from the accusation that he, he is supporting extremism. So, uh, so you know, it's it's this type of really sort of uh, escalation by the French state that has provoked us as Muslim organisations across the whole world to respond in this way and and to hopefully escalate in other ways as well. Pradeem Brown, we'll be coming to you after the break to continue this conversation. And of course, the next question I would like to ask when we do come back is just, you know, post 9-11, how everything has changed for the Muslim population, especially in Europe and of course in the United States. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Truth to Power. I'm in conversation with Imran Shah. He is the CEO of the Muslim Public Affairs Committee in the United Kingdom. Now, Brother Imran, uh, obviously, just before we went into the break, I touched on 9-11. Now, I'd experienced personal attacks being a first-generation Muslim kid that went to a white school, or as we would say in South Africa, a Model C school. And immediately after 9-11, I 
suffered some sort of discrimination where a lot of us as Muslim kids, or there was about 10 or 15 of us, had been labeled as a terrorist immediately after that had happened. But I'm sure in Europe and of course in the United States, it must have been much worse. When you see images of looting, assault that were happening to Muslim citizens within those various places, within those continents, from an organizational point of view, just describe to us the challenges to try and get the morale or try and just at least keep the confidence within Muslims during that dark period? So, I mean, the struggle was twofold. First of all, we have to, uh, you know, acknowledge that racism and Islamophobia predates 9-11. Mm. Uh, and, you know, like in the UK in particular, and also you see in France, street Islamophobia, but also state um, racism uh, uh, really was kind of part and parcel of our everyday lives. In the 70s and the 80s, we were used to like, um, you know, police wouldn't really sort of like take notice of any complaints of racist uh, uh, assaults, uh, like vandalism uh, or anything like that. So it had to be communities that would self-organize and fight back sometimes physically just to defend their own communities. Things did get better somewhat on an institutional level, but the politics uh, and the, um, the, the, you know, sometimes the tensions in the community would still so, would still be there simmering. So when it came to uh, post 9-11 and into the build-up of the Iraq war, remember the UK and the US were bidding to go to a war, to war with Iraq and Afghanistan, you had really this um, emergence of what we call you know, the Islamophobia industry. In the US, you had war hawks, neoconservatives, uh, think tanks being built by, uh, being funded by the tune of like tens of millions. They were essentially uh, proudly the people that were activists on the front line pushing and, you know, full-time job demonizing Islam and Muslims. Some of those, or many of those, were essentially publicly what they call themselves ultra-Zionists. So you had like this, this uh, political sort of um, nexus between Zionism and Islamophobia here in the West. And, and you know, yes, there was, it was almost as if a lot of the political class and a lot of um, you know the think tanks embraced, and especially the the media embraced these narratives uh, and really sort of propagated these narratives of of, of Islamophobia up until and throughout the Iraq War. And to kind of give you an example, like even after um, you know Saddam Hussein has been taken down, um, there was a massive spike around two thousand eight. Uh, 2009, a uh, massive spike in hate crime on the street, so verbal, physical, and and when you look at the time scale for that, that was the exact same time where there's a massive debate around the banning of the club. Hmm. It had nothing to do with the Iraq war, had nothing to do with terrorism, it was about a harmless piece of cloth that some Muslim women wear, and how that is a security threat, how that's a threat to our values, and this is still a narrative that's happening uh, in in uh, France, it's, uh, there's uh, I understand there's a referendum now being called upon upon banning the club in Switzerland. Um, so you know this is something uh, being used to create a, a sense of threat, a sense of cultural and and uh, urgent sort of uh, threat uh, by a piece of clothing that some Muslims wear. And then this carried on. It went on to halal meat. It went on to you know, the, the, how bad um, Julia courts are, you know, how barbaric they are, how misogynistic and, and so on. It went on to uh, so many different parts of our face, where every single part of our face was demonized. And then you had, you know, um, you know attack on institutions like the Trojan Horse Affair in the UK, where uh, basically the Minister of Education created, Michael Gold created this scandal out of an unsigned letter and said, we're going to target these Muslim schools and we're going to say that there's a, an Islamic extremism problem amongst these, uh, amongst these schools and they're teaching and they're radicalizing these kids. And much later, many, many years, once all the damage was done, yes, there were, the teachers were vindicated once they've lost their jobs, once their reputation has been tarnished, they found out there actually wasn't a Trojan horse plot at all. It, it, the Muslims weren't taking over schools and uh, essentially spreading um, extremism. And in the US, you know, you had the whole ground zero 
uh, mosque uh, fiasco that again is a made up story. So you have so many instances of the last 20 years where stories were kind of just made out of nothing. You know, it's ironic because you had tr uh, Trump calling out fake news all this time, but it was his type of political allies uh, and, and many people that supported him that were the people of creating fake news against Muslims and, and uh, Islam. So, um, and this, this creates a real, um, and it still is a, a, a very um, a, a toxic situation. You had the Iraq war, the war in Afghanistan, um, and, you know, but now it's, trying to, it's morphed into a cold war against Muslims. And what, what that's now transformed into is essentially the state clamping down on uh, independent civil Muslim society, institutions, anybody who is independent of the, of the, of the state is dehumanized. Uh, so even mainstream organizations like myself, like Muslim Council of Britain, like, um, you know, CAGE, others, those that have genuine voices, they are sidelined, demonized in the media, and the government creates their own institutions. And you've had similar things happening uh, in France right now. Uh, you've had, there is calls in, across Europe to essentially create a, uh, uh, to create a system where imams can only be practicing when they're, when they're certified by the state. Yeah. I would say for the US, there are some constitutional um, uh, things that kind of enable ensuring some degree of freedom. But the, 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 the openness of white supremacy uh, in, the, in America is much more opaque, it's much more open. And so there are bigger threats, more direct threats that have been experienced by Muslims, like you know, Chapel Hill shooting, uh, that is, was against black, uh, 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 essentially a black church. But you've also had like, uh, um, there was an incident where three Muslims uh, were essentially just uh, we, were shot uh, in the home that, that became a viral campaign. Um, you've had all these sort of incidents where Muslims are, are facing real physical threats in the US and here in the, in, in the UK and across Europe. That threat is definitely on the street, but that threat is far more institutional and far more top down, I would say, in the US, uh, especially now after Trump. Brother Imran, you mentioned obviously in the first section about what was going on in France with the ID system that uh, uh, Macron wanted to establish, especially towards Muslims. And when I cast my mind back towards obviously pre-World War II and Hitler's purging of uh, the Jewish people in Germany and of course when he went through to Poland and of course forcing them into ghettos and, you know, the cruelty that we saw, of course, with the Holocaust. What Macron is doing right now, when listening to so many Muslims in France, listening to people like yourself, is he close to making something like that happen? Now, of course, we wouldn't want that to become a reality. But if, of course, France being a constitution from the outside, if he wants that to happen, how bad could it be for Muslims in France? Look, I mean... You have to wonder why is it Macron has, I mean, he's been president for a number of years now. Mm. Why is it he is in this last year or so become so rapidly uh, Islamophobic? You know, he was at the very beginning of his term saying that hijab should be part of the fabric of, of uh, French society. So why has he done such a U-turn? And really, this can only be explained through electoral terms. You have the National Front, which is essentially the same sort of ideology as, as, as Nazis, uh, as, as Hitler. Um, you know, you, that, that's led by Le Pen. They are essentially, when it comes to the presidential race, um, uh, 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 in terms of elections, they are essentially polling second. Uh, and so in the background of that, Macron is probably trying to be opportunistic and show actually uh, I, I do have these Islamophobic uh, uh, racist credentials too. You want to also vote. And also I have all these sort of things that are actually better for governance and in terms of the economy as well. And so he's trying to essentially place himself in an upcoming election as someone that is um, quote unquote middle ground. And really what's happening is that he's normalizing white wing policies uh, and, and what the, and the the reason why that will never essentially help him is because as soon as you normalize 
a culture and an acceptance of these policies, then all you tend to do is actually normalize the presence of far right parties like mm -hmm. National Front. So, you know, um, uh, so it, we, we got to understand it on that level that it is about power play and his weaponization of Islamophobia for his own electoral game. Uh, so, I mean, uh, and the thing to understand is that as soon as the separation, separation bill, which included the policy that you mentioned and many others, uh, was uh, is in parliament, the same party, the Front National, are now calling for stronger, more um, oppressive, more draconian, more racist uh, and xenophobic uh, policies. So they're not stopping, they're advancing, saying like, we, you, all right, fine, you accepted this, my friend. We now want this. We, we want to push the bar forward. So it, it's, it's and to answer your question, right now, it is looking quite dire. You, you're looking at a situation where the, they are in the center of power, they are calling the shots, and it's now in the French, in order to save French democracy and even European democracy, mm. you've got to have a coming together of not just Muslim organizations, you've got to have French and European civil society, as well as human rights organizations, and generally the left coming together because Otherwise, you're going to, this is already eroding democracy here in Europe. And as soon as civil society, the voice of civil society across the board, it becomes smaller and smaller as it is already, that will, uh, that will essentially create conditions where there is no opposition. And as soon as there's no opposition, there is no democracy. So right now, it's a state of urgency. It's a state of emergency where everybody who wants to live in a healthy society needs to come come together regardless of political differences and fight fight this threat coming up after the break the big question is what can the united nations do in order to make sure this does not accelerate out of control stay tuned to truth to power Welcome back to Truth to Power. I'm continuing my conversation with Imran Shah. Brother Imran, now the United Nations and obviously in its previous guise as the League of Nations uh, pre-World War II, when it came to stopping of far right-wing groups, and I'm going to especially talk about Hitler and Mussolini and of course trying to stop them, you know, plunging the world into war, the League of Nations had failed. Now, of course, enter the United Nations, this has been an organization, and of course, with the veto powers that were given to, un to the United States and the United Kingdom, they were, of course, not able to prevent the wars in Afghanistan and the one in Iraq. From a civil society perspective, the pressure that has been put on the United Nations, how much conviction is there that this organization, which is seen to be the body that's meant to protect the world, can stop Emmanuel Macron his purging of Muslims in France, and of course the purging of Muslims and other minority groups that are happening across the world. So we've got to be uh, clear, mm. there's lots of problems with the UN, mm. uh, and it's not truly democratic, but it has some degree of influence and power, it has some degree of prestige, and it has some degree of, of soft power as a result. So, I mean, first of all, the, the reason why, there's a number of reasons why we submit this complaint. First is to essentially uh, keep this issue on the table. Macron would prefer that we and others just simply stay silent and we don't talk about this at all. It's only framed in the language that he wants to frame it and nothing else. So this is first of all to essentially assert that actually we're not going to go away, we're not going to be silent, and it is an obligation of us to essentially, you know, uh, uh, you know, speak truth to power. It is it's mm. our obligation of Muslims, wherever we can, to make change with our hand, uh, if not with our tongue, and if not in our heart. So, you know, that, that is part of our faith. So that is something we must exercise. But if, say, like, you know, the, the UN uh, basically uh, investigates and they make a ruling that is against France. That is no small thing. 
maybe for us, like, you know, uh, like citizens on the ground, it won't impact us in any way. Like, I'm sure, like France and Macron will try and push forward. But what it does, it gives us leverage because what it, what it means is that it's something that wider civil society and indeed, um, you know, wider sort of uh, uh, nation states and their political leaders cannot ignore. At the moment, it is essentially just Muslims, Muslim organizations talking about this uh, regularly in, in various different spaces. But when you have a verdict in the UN, that essentially takes a life of its own. And there's certain leverage that you can have for that. Mm. And it's also stating, uh, saying, uh, sending a message to anybody else who's thinking of doing the same in the West. Like, there are, uh, just because you know, uh, French is a Western nation and tries, like many other Western nations, to be seen as, um, you know, civilized and um, uh, superior in its values and all of that, uh, you know, propaganda. What it state, what it will state, is that no, just because you see yourself like this, just because this is rubber stamped, uh, stamped by you as a French nation does not mean that it's okay. Mm. Uh, and mm. by human rights standards, you are failing uh, by this. Uh, and so it, it sends a message and, and it enables us, as well as many different people uh, across the whole world, to essentially point, point the finger against Macron. And it's where we want to keep the pressure. The pressure point isn't on the French state in particular, it's on Macron who's leading this agenda and making him an example of, of like, of like you wanted to do this for political gain, you wanted this to work for you, and guess what? It didn't work. Mm. And politicians will always look to that and see, well, what happened here? If Macron succeeds uh, to a large degree, other Islamophobic parties, as well as maybe people who are just European and maybe liberal, will look at that and be like, well, this is what works for political gain in, in, in democracies. But if it does not work, then they'll be much more hesitant to replicate that across the board. So yes, the UN doesn't, uh, the UN complaint doesn't necessarily give us any instant advantage, but it helps us build us build up momentum in the long term and helps us to gain leverage in that in that long term fight. Brother Imran, I think both you and I can agree that when we, of course, look at France, uh, it is of course a democratic country with multi parties that are there. Uh, when you take, of course, other nations like China, where uh, the, the, the Uyghur Muslims are also going through, you know, uh, the purging uh, courtesy of the Chinese government. And, you know, other purging that is happening uh, across Europe uh, in the western part of it. And, of course, you know, we take, cast our mind to what Narendra Modi is doing in India with regards to Kashmir and of the Muslims in India. Now, it, with the pandemic that has happened, no one is expecting the United Nations to just go ahead and pour in troops to overturn the government based on the purging of Muslims. Uh, it would need other factors for that to happen. But do you feel that harsh sanctions on these nations, if it ever comes to it, which I think both you and I can say that it may not happen, but would you as an organization in the perfect world want for those for some sort of sanctions to be put on? And, and of course, we can start with that in France, for there to be some sort of sanctions that can say, you know what, the human rights issues are not going well, maybe it's time for us to put the foot down. So I mean, sanctions has been used in the past for political reasons, and and like uh, you know, going back to Iraq, like no one likes Saddam Hussein, but but the the reason the but sanctions what that did it meant that the poorest and the most impoverished suffered more. It wasn't Saddam Hussein. Mm. So we have gotta be careful when it comes to sanctions um, in what context we play. Um, you know, there, there was a massive boycott, push for boycott of French products after, um, you know, um, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, this year. Mm. Uh, and that did more, you know, for remarkably Macron, uh, and he uh, mobilized his diplomatic uh, uh, services to essentially uh, control that message and to come back into Arab nations to please start boycotting our products. The and then even when it comes to like South Africa, it was that group, uh, bottom up, that grassroots push for, for boycott that actually worked. It wasn't, and eventually the nation states got on board. So when we're looking at sanctions, we need to be careful that where do we apply those sanctions? So when it comes to India, if, if a sanctions was applied for the whole of India, 
that would only probably most likely make the most poorest in India, the very poorest, suffer even more. It wouldn't touch those that are actually funding Hindu nationalism, who are supporting Modi, who are who have the broadest shoulders and the deepest pockets. Um, so in the case of India, that that may that will actually be if it was India wide, be actually be very counterproductive. Uh, so we need to look at you know where is the specific, who are the main actors, who are the main uh, bodies, uh, where should we essentially target? Should we target individuals, organisations instead of whole nation states? With China, that's a that's an interesting one because mm-hmm. essentially that you have a party that has entire control of the whole country, essentially making these laws and sanctions. It's it's again it's difficult because some people are calling for sanctions upon like what's happening in Xinjiang, uh, in uh, and also what's um, uh, like like you know certain factories or productions that happen by forced labor of Uyghur Muslims. Others are calling for entire sort of sanction of the of, of the Chinese state. And I can see why they would want a sanction for the whole Chinese state because that's more than just simply cutting up the economic uh, benefit of of the oppression, but also the reputational and diplomatic sort of uh, consequence of of those sanctions. China has worked very hard to open itself to the world. And to force itself to close you know, into itself would be against the, the agenda of the Chinese government. So it's, 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 it's easy just to say, oh, that country is oppressing Muslims, therefore we should push for sanctions. We have to be much more surgical, much more delicate, and understand the power play of what, of, of, of what we want to essentially achieve uh, uh, in each scenario. Well, coming up after the break, is white supremacy starting to feel the heat from minority groups. Of course, just last year, we saw the rise or the continuous rise of Black Lives Matter. Now, are Muslims getting together and, of course, trying to find a way to counter any sort of far right-wing groups and white supremacy across Europe and the United States? We'll continue this conversation after the break. Welcome back to Truth to Power. Now, last year in June, Black Lives Matter took a whole new level after the deaths of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. Then, of course, a four months later, we just heard Emmanuel Macron's comments against Muslims and, of course, the potential of the purging of Muslims to have its continuation. Now, Brother Imran, when you look at, you know, these two sort of organizations that uh, may not have been coming together, but they are intertwined in some way. Is there a sense that, for now, from a consolation point of view, that far-right-wing groups and white supremacy are starting to feel the heat and there is a bit of pressure being implied to them? Yeah, I mean, uh, there is definitely everything that's kind of happening in, in the last decade or so is not just simply in the context of, of the, the so-called war on terror, but it's also like um, you know this this uh, what would I, I would know some activists uh, uh, would joke to be like the, the last sort of dying uh, breath of white supremacy. Mm-hmm. I, I personally am not that optimistic, but you know there is a real sense that whiteness, uh, which was really constructed firmly during empire, is is has been challenged and is uh, aggressively becoming more desperate. Uh, as as um, as time goes on, like we're starting to see a much more emergence of a non-white uh, faces in, across the whole political spectrum, but especially in in, in our radical politics, uh, and uh, even the acceptance and the, the the mainstreaming of those radical politics. That's more about um, like you would call quote unquote like this uh, political blackness, like the the black the politics of equality of inclusion. As opposed to the politics of, of um, division and, and, and um, racialism that is white supremacy. So, 
Um, yeah, I mean, completely. The, the, the rise of the National Front, the, even Brexit, e even the, the rise of various different neo-Nazi parties across Europe is essentially a pushback to immigration, but also the fact that they need to accept that there's other people in their world that are different, have different cultures, um, that are, are part of this world and, uh, and essentially share um, and, and are part of their societies as well. So, yeah, I mean, like we, we've got to uh, understand that the, the main thing we need to understand the context of empire uh, and the, the, the cultural and the social sort of uh, ramifications of that are still there. Like, it, again, like I was explaining, it was the 70s and the 80s, not just in the UK, but in, in, the, uh, uh, in France and various other countries, the, the same tropes that were used and propagated during the empire um, uh, were essentially being used when it comes to the domestic setting here in the UK and in Europe and, and, and the US. Like, it was just in Algeria, they made examples of women wearing a garb uh, and hijab, tear them off in public and, and try to uh, celebrate it. And that was reported widely in French media. And it was only in 1989 where headscarves become a controversy in, in French schools. And again, this keeps repeating this, this cultural war that benefited empire is constantly being played out decade after decade. And so, I mean, Islamophobia is an interesting thing because, you know, various commentators, academics uh, have, have said that actually this is an accumulation of all the different bigotries that kind of exist. So, so Adam and Husband in 2006 said that colour, historical national identity, minority, minority ethnic identity, cultural identity and Islam are fused in contemporary British Islamophobia. So what he means is that race, as well as cultural um, racism, as well as national sort of like uh, uh, identity of like what white supremacists feed off, that all of that is 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 kind of uh, amalgamated uh, and uh, essentially contained and combined uh, when it comes to Islamophobia. So we need to, as Muslim organisations, as Muslims, and as as, as non-Muslims who are, who see the struggle for equality as as as, as a just one need to understand we're still operating in this yoke of Islamophobia. And whilst we've, we've made gains, they are escalating because of those gains, and we need to escalate as well. Brother Imran, uh, of course, just last week, we saw the State of the Union and the inauguration of the new US President, Joe Biden. Now, his predecessor, of course, I mean, it can't get any worse. We saw how he's put the purging of black Africans and, of course, Muslims under the watch of Donald Trump had occurred in the US. What are your colleagues in the United States saying about Joe Biden? We have seen, to a certain extent, you know, the warm diplomacy that he wants to instill. But is there a sense of optimism that the, uh, the, the relationship between the Muslim community in the United States, the Middle East, and of course we can touch on what is happening, the Israeli occupation of Palestine. What are your colleagues saying with regards to how Joe Biden will treat Muslims uh, in this new term of his presidency? I mean, first of all, there's a big sigh of relief that the heat that Trump brought domestically would, they would hope, is essentially going to essentially, uh, you know, disappear. Already the quote-unquote Muslim ban has been uh, overturned. Um, uh, there's other sort of policies as well. You would want to see that, like, uh, you know, children in cages uh, um, uh, uh, in the custody of ICE, would essentially start to disappear, and that's a key thing that we, that, you know, they're looking out for. But there is generally a sense that that there is more, there's more space to breathe. Before there was like a, a real sense of suffocation that if he does get another term, already you have white militia groups mm. uh, essentially mm -hmm. mobilizing, and you know you, you could see even in the last days of the Trump presidency, they they took over Capitol Hill like after many 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 years saying that Muslims were the ones that are going to take over the country. They just went and did it themselves. So it, it was it was um, a moment of irony, but it also is it kind of epitomizes what what the, the fear of Trump in many minds of Muslims and and, and essentially non-white people in America. Um, so there is a general sense domestically that you know things are karma um, and that essentially that we can 
try and roll back a lot of the stuff that's come in and, and push forward. With, with regards to Palestine and um, uh, and the Israeli apartheid there, that would that would be an interesting one. Yes, okay. I mean, there has been a lot of talk of uh, Biden making sure there is no, uh, you know, going back to India, no RSS affiliated, no Hindu national nationalist affiliated um, uh, members of his of his team. Um, and yes, he has introduced like those that are publicly Muslim in his team. But he's also said that essentially that um, Biden himself is going to remain a friend of Israel. Now, obviously, that's not surprising as, as, as a stance of America. He is still within the American system. A lot of people thought that, uh, you know, Obama would bring a lot of hope to the world. And, you know, in some ways, I'm sure he tried. But, you know, with, uh, with the uh, military sort of uh, uh, nature and the, the, the way in which the, the US uh, and it governs its, its power around the world, you know, drones was, uh, uh, bombs were still being uh, dropped, drones were, were essentially being uh, essentially um, you know, killing people in various different parts of the world. And Obama didn't become that hope, that symbol that he was internationally, that he was domestically. So Biden, I think he's going to probably receive in a very similar way. Yes, okay, um, there may be a, 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 a sort of like more harsher tone towards Israel, but when it comes to the, the push for normalization, Trumping, would there be a repeal or reverse of that? I don't think so. I think Biden's going to essentially at least sustain that course. One final question to wrap up what has been an amazing you know, discussion with you, brother Imran. Uh, the complaints, have, of course, have been sent to the United Nations. Uh, what is the next step for these 36 NGOs that, of course, have submitted this through to the world body? So we do have plan for escalation. Uh, there are plans to essentially make this and keep this on to the, onto the political agenda. Um, you know, what, what, what we would ask for now is for people to reach out if you want to uh, be involved in this as an organization, please contact uh, myself and Patrick Hay or Cage, or if you're you know, um, are, uh, more closer to South Africa, the Association of Muslim Lawyers, um, and write to, write to the French Embassy. Um, you know, that, that is something that we're, we, we want to see. We want to see many, many different French embassies hearing the message that what they are doing is not uh, is not good at all. Uh, they got the we want uh, embassies to receive that pressure uh, to hear those voices uh, and honestly be as soft and as hard as you want. You don't have to be quote unquote diplomatic about it. Just write, make your voice heard. And you know, obviously, like it's the head of state that hears those messages directly. So if Macron and his administration hears from various different embassies across the world that you know this is becoming more of a problem like he did when it came to the um, uh, boycott of French products, he's going to be thinking twice, he's going to be feeling that pressure. And if we're able to sustain that and keep that pressure on, we could potentially uh, see uh, a couple of wins, if not a complete win in the long term. Brother Imran Shah, Jazakla, so much for making the time for us here on Truth to Power. And we continue to wish you all the luck and we continue to keep uh, your, you in our duas in making sure that your NGO, along with the other NGOs, continue to hold these far right-wing politicians and white supremacists accountable for what they are doing to minority groups. We thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Just have a look here. Thank you. Now, uh, it's an absolute pleasure. That is Imran Shah. He is the CEO of the Muslim Public Affairs Committee in the United Kingdom. And of course, in South Africa, we did see uh, Muslim civil societies and they were joined by the economic freedom fighters just outside the Pretoria Embassy of the French, of course, in that protest to try and get some answers from the French embassy with regards to the purging of Muslims that is happening. The world has experienced so many genocides, uh, the Holocaust that have happened. Millions and millions of lives have been lost. And right now, the Holocaust continues, of course, in China, in Xinjiang with the Uyghur Muslims. And still to date, no one is being held accountable. No one is coming out and going ahead and explaining what is going on right there. But if we look at what's happening in Europe, if it does continue to happen, are we heading for another genocide? Are we heading for another Holocaust? That is something we as the world cannot have, especially with COVID-19 
continuing to ravage the world and taking so many lives that are there. So we see what the NGOs are doing and they're doing work to make sure that these politicians are being held accountable. It's up now to the United Nations to go ahead and enforce and try and make sure that whatever policies are being introduced to suppress Muslims and other ethnic groups does not happen. Well, this has been a, another edition of Truth to Power, the second for the year of 2021. We say Jazakallah to you for joining in. Do join us again, same time, same place, next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.